Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavans, Ned1313 on Twitter, and welcome to the Daily Check-In for November 18th, 2020. It is Wednesday, which means we are getting into the world of tech analysis. And it's also KubeCon slash Cloud Native Foundation Con this week. I don't know why they don't just call it KubeCon, but anyway, <laughs> conference is this week. And I thought today's topic should be why you don't need a service mesh. And spoiler alert, you probably don't need Kubernetes either. <laughs> But I did, so I attended two different panels today. One was a media and analyst panel, and the other one was a general conference panel talking about service meshes and service meshes. And that was the general conclusion is you don't need one. Or at least most of you don't. So I'm going to dive into the specifics about that a little bit more. Before I do that, I just want to mention I have started a Patreon to sort of offset some of the costs that I'm incurring from doing this regular show every day and some of the more intricate demos that I've been doing that have been sucking up a lot of my other time. Uh, in order to offset those costs, I've started a Patreon. If you're interested and you'd like to support the show, it's uh, the starting tier is $2 a month. I mean, two bucks a month for the cost of a cup of coffee. <laughs> you get my internal undying gratitude. And if you go up to the next tier, you get stickers and maybe some other stuff. I'm still working out exactly what all the benefits are going to be, but I can guarantee they're only going to get better, not worse. So if that's of interest to you and you can support me, I know not everyone can at the moment. The link is down in the description and it's very much appreciated. So with that out of the way, I want to check in with you. It's Wednesday. It's hump day. I don't really like that, but it is Wednesday. And if you've made it this far in your Wednesday, it also means you are past the middle of the week and it is all downhill from here to the weekend. That downhill phrase is kind of weird when you think about it, because I've heard it in the context of it's all downhill from here being bad. Like we've crested to the top. We're as good as we're going to get and we're just going downhill from here, just becoming old and decrepit, right? But because I cycle and run a lot, for me, like getting to the top of the hill and then saying it's all downhill from here means it's easier from here. So I think of it as a positive context. So hopefully you're in that positive mental space as well. And let's now dive into the wonderful world of service meshes and why you don't need them. So I, like I said, I attended two panels here and there are a bunch of panelists. So I'll try to call out who said what during the panels and how it influenced what I was thinking. Uh, so I will do my best. Uh, there was on the first one, Dan Berg from IBM, Adit from Solo IO, and Matt Klein from Lyft were on that first panel. And then on the second panel that I watched, Matt Klein from Lyft was there again, along with Lynn Soon from IBM and Alyssa Wilk from Google. So a really good host of people who are deep into the world of service mesh and especially Envoy. And basically, I'd like to start it out with something that Matt Klein said during that first panel, the media panel. He basically said, because we were talking about whether or not you need a service mesh, and he said, we're asking the wrong fundamental question. The question we should be asking ourselves is, do you even need a microservices application? Huh. Okay, that's reframing the question a little bit. We're back and way up and saying, hey, service mesh is one thing. Do you even need to break your application into microservices? Are there benefits for you doing that? And there are absolutely cases, obviously, when it does make sense to break an application into microservices. But as a foil to that, in the second panel, Lynn brought up the fact that at IBM, a project that she was working on was a microservices application using a service mesh for its control plane. And the thing that they realized was they had overcomplicated their solution and it didn't need any of those bells and whistles. All of the services were using the same programming language. So it wasn't this polyglot thing where you needed that API layer as an abstraction between the various services. It was one cohesive application. It was a control plane. So maybe breaking it up didn't necessarily make sense. And the service mesh was was just giving them all kinds of problems. What did they end up doing? She said they ended up combining <laughs> all of those services into a monolith application and running it that way. And a lot of the issues that they were having that had nothing to do with the application and everything to do with the architecture went away. So that's a huge win for her. So that is, uh, you know, a counter example to the idea that you should always break your application into microservices. 
Okay, but let's say you are writing an application and it is in microservices. Do you need a service mesh then? Once again, Matt Klein comes in with the answer and says, maybe, but maybe you don't. You have to look and weigh the costs of running a service mesh versus the benefits that you're gonna get. And in the second panel, he made a point to say that we as organizations in IT are not always great at making TCO calculations. What's the total cost of ownership of a particular application or a particular solution? And I would go one step further and there's actually another metric, return on investment. So you're going to spend this money, the total TCO, and what you need to do to look at is, do I get a return on the investment of time and money? Are the benefits of service mesh outweighing the overhead and the additional complexity that I'm experiencing? And a point that Dan Berg made in the first panel was, he advocated for simpler solutions to complex problems. So at a bare minimum, you want to implement a solution that is as simple as possible, but still meets the requirements of your complex problem. So look at your problem, determine requirements, and then find the solution that has the lowest level of complexity for the greatest benefit. And that is, I mean, that's almost just like basic economics, right? I was like, that is the way to think about it. He said that he is seeing people adopt service meshes, but not use any of the advanced features. They're really just dropping it in to add mutual TLS between all the different services and additional observability because all of those little proxies that are sitting attached to sidecars can send observability information from those sidecars to whatever your monitoring solution is, whatever you happen to be using, whether it's Prometheus or something else. You can send all that logging information. Now you have observability into the traffic and flows. Part of the reason you need that additional observability is the complexity that is involved when you're running a microservices application and you're using a service mesh. And this is something that both Matt and Lynn brought up in the second panel. When you add all these proxies into your solution, especially if you're also using an API gateway at the front, that's proxying things, you end up with, they were, with what they were calling proxy chains, which is a proxy to a proxy to a proxy. And the thing that they're said is, but you need to line up the timeouts for all of those proxies because HTTP one doesn't deal with timeouts consistently all that well. And if you don't have your timeouts set up correctly across all the proxies, you'll get dropped responses. You'll get no response sometimes. Things will time out and then it'll time out somewhere in the chain and now you need to figure out where in that chain the whole thing fell apart. If you don't have a service mesh sitting in front of that, there's less connections to troubleshoot because it's simply going from the front end directly to the service or from one service directly to another. You don't have that additional hop in there. The other thing that Lynn said is what you'll often get is these 503 errors that don't really tell you anything about what failed. It's just a generic response failure. That's not helpful. Now, Alyssa did jump in and say that the way that Envoy is written is it puts a unique tag on every response, and then you can use that response, that unique tag in the response header to track down where it failed in the proxy chain. But do you really wanna do that? Like, that's a lot of work. And this is just like a, a small taste of the incredible additional overhead that you assume when you add a service mesh. So what's the solution? What should you do? Well, if you are a big organization and you have big organization problems, service mesh might be right for you. Alyssa gave the example that at her team in Google, they have an operations team that runs a service mesh and then has, has multiple application teams that leverage that same service mesh. So they get this sort of economy of scale. You have one team that's running the service mesh and then a bunch of other ones that are benefiting from it. So you've dedicated that administrative overhead and that operations team gets to take advantage of the additional security and observ observability they're getting from that service mesh. So for them, it makes sense. But you said, if you're a startup with like five people in one application, don't do it. It doesn't make sense because you don't have those problems yet. And you're not gonna see the benefit for the amount of you know, time and money you put into adding that service mesh. Matt Klein brought up the point that what you should really be doing is looking at managed platforms and services from something like a cloud provider or an on-prem provider like Red Hat and OpenShift 
and seeing if there's a managed solution that gives you the benefits that you want from Service Mesh without the administrative complexity that you get from Service Mesh. And that's sort of the win-win. And then if at some point later down the line, you do need to break up your application and add a Service Mesh, you can do that. But if that never comes up, well, then you never had to invest that additional engineering time and resources into supporting that service mesh. So ultimately, like everything in IT, do you need a service mesh? The answer is it depends. But for a large swath of the population, the answer is no, you don't. And like I said at the beginning, you probably don't need Kubernetes either. Although it's cool, I like playing with this stuff, I have to admit it. But I, you know, you probably don't need it. Now, I'm going to be doing a whole podcast episode about this on day two cloud. So when that happens, I'll go and add a link down in the description, but that's not going to be for a couple months. But just keep an eye out for that. And we're also going to be doing an excellent episode that's going to drop in the next week or two, I believe, on why Kubernetes is wrong for you. So I'll throw one in the description when that drops as well. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching watching. Please subscribe and share if you don't mind. Really appreciate it on this side. Until next time, stay healthy, stay safe out there. Bye for now.